the problem starts to emerge when um, the things that you convert into computational language start to expand. For example, mm -hmm. into the realm of politics. Mm -hmm. So this is where it's almost like this nice dance of Wolfram Alpha and uh, Chat GPT. Chat GPT, like you said, is uh, uh, shallow and broad. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's gonna give you an opinion on everything. But it writes fiction as well as fact, which is exactly how it's built. I mean, that's exactly, it is making language. And it is making both, even in code, it writes fiction. I mean, it's kind of fun to see sometimes, you know, it'll write fictional Wolfram language code. Yeah. That, that, um, that kind of looks right. Yeah, it looks right, but it's actually not pragmatically correct. Yeah. Um, but, but yes, it's, it's a, it has a view of kind of roughly how the world works at, at the same level as, as books of fiction talk about roughly how the world works. They just don't happen to be the way the world actually worked or whatever. But yes, that, that's, um, no, I, I agree. That's sort of a, um, you know, we are attempting with, with our whole, you know, Wolfram language, computational language thing to represent uh, at least, well, it's either, it doesn't necessarily have, have to be how the actual world works because we can invent a set of rules mm -hmm. that aren't the way the actual world works and run those rules but then we're saying we're going to accurately represent the results of running those rules, which might or might not be the actual rules of the world. But we also are trying to capture features of the world uh, as accurately as possible to represent what happens in the world. Now, again, as we've discussed, you know, the, the atoms in the world arranged, you know, you say, uh, I don't know, you know, was there a tank that showed up, you know, that, that, you know, drove somewhere. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, you know, what is a tank? It's an arrangement of atoms that we abstractly describe as a tank. Mm -hmm. And you could say, well, you know, there's some arrangement of atoms that is a different arrangement of atoms, but it's, and it's not, you know, we didn't, we didn't decide, it's like this observer theory question mm -hmm. of, you know, what what arrangement of atoms counts as a tank versus not a tank? So there's there's even things that we consider strong facts. You could start to kind of disassemble them and show that they're Absolutely. not. Right. I mean, so so the question of whether, oh, I don't know, was this gust of wind strong enough to blow over this particular thing? Yeah. Well, a gust of wind is a complicated concept. You know, it's full of little pieces of fluid dynamics and little vortices here and there. And you have to define, you know, was it, you know, what the aspect of the gust of wind that you care about might be it put this amount of pressure on this, you know, blade of some, some, you know, wind turbine or something. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, that, that's the, um, um, and, but, but, you know, if you say, if you have something which is the fact of the gust of wind was this strong or whatever, that, you know, that is, you have to have some definition of that. You have to have some measuring device that says, according to my measuring device that was constructed this way, the gust of wind was this. So what can you say about the nature of truth that's useful for us to understand Chad GPT? Because you've been, con you've been contending with this idea of what is fact and not. And it seems like Chad GPT is used a lot now. I've seen it used by journalists to write articles. <laughs> And so you have um, people that are working with large language models trying to desperately figure out how do we essentially censor them through different mechanisms, uh, either manually uh, or through reinforcement learning with human feedback, try to align them to, right. to not say fiction, to, right. to say nonfiction as much as possible. Right. Well, this is the importance of computational language as an intermediate. It's kind of like you've got the large language model, it's able to surface something which is a formal, precise thing yeah. that you can then look at and you can run tests on it and you can do all kinds of things. It's always gonna work the same way and it's precisely defined what it does. And then the large language model is the interface. I mean, the way I view these large language models, one of their important, I mean, there are many use cases and you know, it's a remarkable thing. I could talk about some of these, you know, literally, you know, every day we're coming up with a couple of new use cases, mm -hmm. um, some of which are very, very, very surprising. Um, and things where, I mean, but the best use cases are ones where it's, you know, even if it gets it roughly right, it's still a huge win. Like a use case we had from a week or two ago is uh, read our bug reports. 
You know, we've got hundreds of thousands of bug reports that have accumulated over decades. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, can we have it just read the bug report, figure out where the where is the bug likely to be? Mm -hmm. And, you know, home in on that piece of code, maybe it'll even suggest some, some you know, uh, sort of way to fix the code. Mm -hmm. It might get that, it might be nonsense what it says to, about how to fix the code, but it's incredibly useful that it was able to, you know. Yeah, so uh, awesome. It's right. so awesome because even the nonsense will somehow be instructive. I don't, I don't quite understand that yet. I've, I've yeah, there's so many programming related things. Like, uh, for example, uh, uh, translating from one programming language to another is really, really right. interesting. It's extremely effective, but then you, the failures reveal the path forward. Also, yeah, so but I think I mean the the, the big thing. I mean, in, in that kind of discussion. The unique thing about our computational language is it was intended to be read by humans. Yes, and so it that's has, really important, right? And so it has this thing where you can, but but you know, thinking about sort of ChatGPT and its use and so on, the one of the big things about it, I think, is it's a linguistic user interface. Mm -hmm. That is, so a typical use case might be, and take the journalist case for example. Mm -hmm. It's like, let's say I have five facts that I'm trying to turn into an article. Or I'm trying to, I'm trying to write a report where I have basically five facts that I'm trying to include in this report. Mm -hmm. But then I feed those five facts to ChatGPT. It puffs them out into this big report, and then, and then that's a good interface for a, a, you know another. If I just gave, if I just had in my terms those five bullet points, and I gave them to some other person, the person would say, "I don't know what you're talking about," because these are, you know, this is your version of this sort of quick notes about these five bullet points. Mm -hmm. But if you puff it out into this thing, which is kind of connects to the collective understanding of language, then somebody else can look at it and say, oh, "Okay, I understand what you're talking about." Now, you can also have a situation where that thing that was puffed out is fed to another large language model. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of like, you know, you're applying for the permit to, you know, uh, I don't know grow fish in some place or something like this. And it, uh, you know, it, it um, um, and, and you have these facts that you're putting in, you know, I'm gonna have a, a, a you know, I'm gonna you know, have this kind of water and I don't know what yes. it is. Um, you just got a few bullet points. It puffs it out into this big application. You fill it out. Then at the other end, the, you know, the fisheries bureau has another large language model that just crushes it down because the fisheries bureau cares about these three points mm -hmm. and it knows what it cares about. And it then, so it's really the, the natural language produced by the large language model is sort of a transport layer that, you know, is really LLM communicates with LLM. I mean, it's kind of like the, you know, I write a piece of email using my LLM yeah. and, you know, puff it out from the things I want to say. Your LLM turns it into, and the conclusion is X. Now, the issue is, you know, that the thing is going to make this thing that is sort of semantically plausible. Mm -hmm. And it might not actually be what you, you know, it might not be kind of, relate to the world in the way that you think it should relate to the world. Now, I, I've seen this, you know, I, I've been doing, okay, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, I was doing this thing when we announced this this uh, plugin for, for, for ChatGPT. I had this lovely example of a math word problem, some complicated thing, and it did a spectacular job of taking apart this elaborate thing about, you know, this person has twice as many chickens as this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and it turned it into a bunch of equations. Mm -hmm. It fed them to Wolfram Language, we solved the equations, everybody did great, mm -hmm. we gave back the results, and I thought, okay, I'm gonna put this in this blog post I'm writing. Okay, I thought, I better just check. And turns out, it got everything, all the hard stuff it got right, at the very end, last two lines, it just completely goofed it up and mm -hmm. gave the wrong answer. And I would not have noticed this. Mm -hmm. Same thing happened to me two days ago. Okay, so I, I thought, you know, I, I made this with this ChatGPT plugin kit, mm -hmm. I made a thing, that would emit a sound, would play a tune on my local computer, mm -hmm. right? So ChatGPT would produce you know, a series of notes and it would play this tune on my computer. Very cool. Okay, so I thought, I'm gonna ask it, play the tune that Hal sang mm -hmm. when Hal was being disconnected in 2001, mm -hmm. okay? So it, it, there it is. Daisy, was it Daisy? Yes. Daisy, yes. yeah. Right. So, so, okay. So I think, you know, and so it produces a bunch of notes and I'm like, this is spectacular. This yeah. is amazing. And then I thought, you know, I was just going to put it in. And then I thought I better actually play this. 
And so I did, and it was Mary had a little lamb. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. But it was Mary had a little lamb. Yeah. Yes. Wow. So it's correct, but wrong. <laughs> yes. It was, uh, yes. you could easily be mistaken. Yes, right. And in fact, I, I kind of gave the, I had this quote from Hal to explain, you know, it's, it's as it, the, the Hal, you know, states in the movie, you know, it's uh, the Hal 9000 is, you know, the thing was just a, a rhetorical device because I'm realizing, oh my gosh, you know, this chat GPT, you know, could have easily fooled me. I mean, it did this, it did all the, it did this amazing thing of knowing this thing about the movie and being able to turn that into the, the notes of the song except it's the wrong song. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Hal, in, in the movie, Hal says, you know, I think it's something like, you know, no Hal, nine, no 9000 series computer has ever been found to make an error. Mm -hmm. We are, for all practical purposes, perfect mm -hmm. and um, incapable of error. And I thought that was kind of a charming sort of uh, quote from uh, from Hal to make in connection with uh, with what ChatGPT had done yeah, in that it, case. The interesting things about the LLMs, like you said, that they are very willing to admit their error. Well, yes, I mean that's a question of the RLH, uh, the reinforcement learning human feedback thing. Oh, right. That that that's you know that's nice an feature. LLM. The the really remarkable thing about ChatGPT is you know I had been following what was happening with large language models and I played with them a whole bunch and they were kind of like yeah you know kind of like what you would expect based on sort of sort of statistical continuation of language. It's, it's interesting, but it's not breakout exciting. Mm -hmm. And then I think the kind of the, the kind of reinforcement, the, the human feedback reinforcement learning, uh, you know, in, in making ChatGPT try and do the things that humans really wanted to do, that broke through, yeah. that kind of reached this threshold where the thing really is interesting to us humans. And by the way, it's interesting to see how, you know, you change the temperature or something like that, the thing goes bonkers. And it no longer is interesting to humans. It's producing garbage. Yeah. Um, and it's it's kind of right, it's somehow, it managed to get this, this above this threshold where it really is well aligned to what we humans are interested in. And uh, and, and kind of that that's, um, and, and I think, you know, nobody, saw that coming, I think. Uh, certainly nobody I've talked to and nobody who was involved in, in that project seems to have known it was coming. It's just one of these things that is a sort of remarkable threshold. I mean, it, you know, when we built Wolfram Alpha, for example, I didn't know it was going to work. You know, we tried to build something that would have enough knowledge of the world, that it could answer a reasonable set of questions, that we could do good enough natural language understanding that typical things you type in would work. We didn't know where that threshold was. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was not sure that it was the right decade to try and build this, even the right, you know, 50 years to try and build it. You know, and I think that was, it's the same type of thing with ChatGPT that I don't think anybody could have predicted that, you know, 2022 would be the year that this this became possible. I think, yeah, you tell a story about Marvin Minsky and showing it to him and saying, no, like, no, 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 this time it actually works. Yes, yes, and, and I uh, mean, it's, you know, it's the same thing for me looking at these large language models. It's like when, when people were first saying the first few weeks of ChatGPT, it's like, oh yeah, you know, I've yeah. seen these large language models. Um, and then, uh, you know, and then I actually try it and, uh, you know, oh my gosh, it actually works. And I think uh, it's, uh, but, it, but you know, the things, and the thing I found, you know, I remember one of the first things I tried was uh, write a persuasive essay that a wolf is the bluest kind of animal, mm -hmm. okay? So it writes this thing and it starts talking about these uh, wolves that live on the Tibetan plateau and yeah. they're named some Latin name and so on. And I'm like, really? And I'm starting to look it up on the web and it's like, well, it's actually complete nonsense, but it's extremely plausible. I mean, it's plausible enough that I was going and looking it up on the web and wondering if there was a wolf that was blue. You know, I mentioned this on some live streams I've done and so people have been sending me these pictures blue wolves. of <laughs> blue wolves. <laughs> Maybe it was onto something.